In this video, we'll learn how to spawn a bunch of objects without spending a lot of processing power. We'll do this using a method called object pooling. We'll get into what it is and why it's useful in just a sec, but first, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with more than 18,000 quality classes on tech, design, and more. And it's actually something that I personally use and love. I recently came across this awesome course on the fundamentals of creating pixel art for games, and I definitely recommend you check it out. A premium membership gives you unlimited access to all classes for less than $10 a month. So to get started, simply click the link in the description and the first 500 people to sign up will get their first two months for only 99 cents. And with that, let's get into the video. So when making a game, you often want to spawn in objects while playing. Of course, Unity has a built-in function for this called instantiate, but using this function is not very performant. In many cases, it's much better to use an object pole. This essentially means that when the game starts, we create a bunch of inactive game objects. In other words, we make a pool of objects. When we then want to spawn one of these objects, instead of creating the object from scratch, we simply take one of the objects from the pool, enable it, and put it in the right place. If we run out of objects in the pool, we can either decide to grow it or reuse older objects. All right, with that explanation, let's jump right into Unity. So here in Unity, I've set up a very simple scene. There's really only a ground and a light and a bit of image effects in here. If we hit play, you can see that I've set up this cube spawner that will just spit out a bunch of cube objects. And that's pretty much all that's happening here. You notice as this go, it spits out more and more cubes and slowly fills up our hierarchy. And it will keep going until Unity crashes. If we have a look at how this works, it's actually very simple. I have a cube spawner object, and on this object, I have a cube spawner script. All this script does is that every fixed update call, it instantiates a cube. And the cube object is here. It's just a rigid body with a cube script attached. And all this script does is calculate a random force that it then adds to the rigid body. So this is a good example of a scene where we can add object pooling to make it more performant. But before we start writing our script, there are a few things that we need to understand. So basically what we want to be able to do is create different object pools. Here we have three pools, pool one, two, and three. And we want each of these pools to be responsible for storing objects of a certain type. We might have the first one store circles, the second one store squares, and you get the idea. And I think the best way to go about this is actually by using a dictionary because the dictionary allows us to create as many pools as we want to and associate each pool with some kind of tag. In our case, it's fairly simple. We could take the first pool and associate it with circles, the second one with squares, and the third one with, well, something. What this allows us to do is in code, access one of these pools using its tag. So if I wanted to access the squares, I'll simply put that in, and this would then give us the square pool. Then I would store each of these objects inside of the pool in what we call a queue. The good thing about a queue is that it's basically like a list, but it's very, very fast to get the first item. And we can also easily add new items to the end of the queue. We can imagine why this is useful because if we wanted to go ahead and instantiate or spawn one of these objects, we would simply take it from the queue and put it inside of our world. And we would actually keep doing this until the pool gets emptied. The smart thing about using a queue in this instance is that if all of our objects are actually currently active in the world, well, we can still go ahead and grab the first one in the queue. And that's just going to be the beginning object. So each time we move them from the pool into the world, we simply re-add them to the queue. And so if we wanted to go ahead and add a new object, say up here, we would simply take the oldest object in the world, which is this one, and move it from that position into the new one. And we could just keep doing that forever. So now that we have a good understanding of how dictionaries and queues can be used to our advantage, it's time to start scripting it out. To do that, let's create a new empty object in our hierarchy. Let's reset the transform on it and let's call it object polar. Let's just drag it to the top so we can always see it. Let's hit a component and let's create a new script called object polar as well. We can then double click it to open it up in Visual Studio. I'm gonna remove the update method here. We won't be using it. And I'm then gonna go to the very top here and I'm gonna create the dictionary. So we'll write public dictionary. And here the dictionary takes two types. The first one is going to be the tag that we want to associate each pool with. This is also referred to as the key. And this is going to be of type string. Second, we want to have the actual pool. And remember, we wanted to store that as a queue. 
So we'll go ahead and create a queue here. And whenever we create a queue, we also need to tell Unity what we want to store in the queue. So we want to go ahead and store a queue of game objects. And we'll call this dictionary pull dictionary. Remember, whenever you're using dictionaries and queues, you want to make sure to be using system.collections.generic. So now in our start method, we can set pull dictionary equal to a new dictionary. And here we can use autocomplete to make it just fill out all of the types. So now we have a new empty dictionary to work with and it's time to start filling it up with pulls of objects. But instead of doing this manually through code, let's have some way of configuring what pulls we want inside of the inspector. To do this, let's go to the top here and let's create our own class called pull. So we'll create a public class, we'll call it pull. And we now choose what we want to store in each pool. First of all, we want to have a string with the tag of the pool. We'll then have a public game object, which is going to store the prefab of the objects in that pool. And finally, we'll have a public int, which is going to store the total size of our pool. That means at which point are we going to start reusing objects instead of spawning in new ones. And to make sure this will show up inside of the inspector, we have to mark it with an attribute called system.serializable. So now we've created this class and let's go ahead and make a list. So we'll create a public list of pools that we'll call pools. If we now save this and head into Unity, we can now see a list of pools show up and we can go ahead and add entries to this. So I'm just gonna add a single one. And now for the first element here, we can define a tag. I'm gonna tag this one as cube. As the prefab, I'm gonna drag in my cube prefab. And as the size here, I'm gonna set that to something like 150. So we'll only have a maximum of 150 active cubes at a time. So now that we have our list of pools, we need to start adding them to the dictionary. To do that, we want to loop through all of the pools. So we'll go for each pool, and we'll call each item pool in our pools list. We wanna go ahead and create a queue of objects. So we'll create a queue here of game objects, We'll call it our object pool and we'll set it equal to a new queue of game objects. And now we want to go through and create each one of these objects. So we'll create another for loop here. And here we want to keep looping as long as i is less than pool.size. In other words, we want to make sure that we fill out our entire pool by instantiating as many objects as we've defined in the size. So now for each one of these, we'll instantiate pool.prefab and we'll store a reference to this object that we just created. So game object, we'll call it object. And now we can go object.setActive false to make sure to disable it so we can't actually see it yet. And finally, we can add it to the end of our queue. To do this, all we need to write is object pool dot in queue, and then we'll feed it our object. And that's really all. So for each pool that we wanna create, we create a queue full of objects. We make sure to add all the objects that we wanna to add to the queue. And finally, we want to add this pool to the dictionary. So we'll go pool dictionary dot add. And here we first wanna give it the tag, so pool dot tag, and then our pool of objects, so object pool. Awesome. So now we should actually see that if we save this, go into Unity and hit play, it immediately spawns 150 cubes that are deactivated in our hierarchy. These are of course not the cubes that we're seeing here, they are added on top by the cube spawner, but we'll go ahead and change that soon. First we need to add functionality for taking some of these inactive cubes and spawning them into our active world. To do that we'll create a new public void and we'll call it spawn from pull. This is first going to take in a string with a tag, which is of course the tag of the object that we want to spawn. And we also want to take in a vector three storing a position. This is where we want to spawn our object as well as a quaternion for the rotation. Now here we can get the prefab that we want to spawn by simply going pull dictionary and then feeding it our tag, just like I showed with the squares in the example. So this now gives us the appropriate queue. And then all we need to do is go dot DQ in order to pull out the first element in the queue. We can then store this object, so we'll create a game object and we'll call it object to spawn and set it equal to that object. And now we can configure our object to spawn so we can set it to active, so enable it. We can also set its position, object to spawn dot transform dot position is going to be equal to position. Object to spawn dot transform dot rotation is going to be equal to rotation. 
So we've actually now taken the object that we want to spawn, set it to active, moved it to the appropriate place in the world. And so it should be showing and working just fine. But we also want to remember to add it back to our queue so that it can be reused later. To do that, we simply go pull dictionary and we remember to pass in the tag dot nq and we feed it the object to spawn. Now there are still some things that we can add here to make it a tiny bit safer and easier to use. One of these is we can go to the top here and check if poll dictionary dot contains key. And this is just to make sure that if we give it a tag that it doesn't have a pool for, we don't go through and cause any errors. So if this is not true, well, then we simply want to go ahead and throw a debug.log warning saying that the pool with tag and then we feed it the tag doesn't exist. There we go. And then we can simply return out of the function. A really nice feature of instantiate that I use a lot, so when we go and instantiate an object, is that it returns the object that we just created. So let's do the same thing here. We'll mark the return type as game object. And right at the end of the function here, we'll return the object to spawn. So now we can always grab it from the place where we spawn it. And here we simply want to return null in the case that there is no object. So that should actually complete the main functionality of our object pooler script. But we still need an easy way to access it from within our cube spawner. To do that, we'll use a very simple singleton pattern. Now, this is not a true singleton, it's just a quick workaround. And if you've never heard of singletons before, or if you want to read more about them, I'll make sure to have a link for that in the description. All we're doing here is just very easily allowing ourselves to grab the object pooler from the cube spawner. So I'm just going to write a public static object pooler, which we'll call instance. And then we'll create an awake method. And in here, we'll simply set instance equal to this. And just to let everyone know that this is an attempt at a singleton, we'll write singleton here and we'll end the region down here. This doesn't do anything. It just allows us to collapse the code like this and we don't have to look at it anymore. So now we can save that. And now when we go into the cube spawner, what this allows us to do is actually delete the variable right here, delete the instantiate call, and instead we can go object polar dot instance dot, and now we can simply call the function from in here. So we'll call spawn from pull. And then we can feed it a tag and we'll use the tag cube. We can feed it a position. We'll just use transform.position as well as a rotation. We'll use quaternion.identity. And there we go. If you're going to be calling this a lot, like I'm doing here, I would recommend storing this in a variable. So we can just do that very quickly. We'll create an object pooler, call it object pooler. And then inside of the start method, we can set object pooler equal to object pooler.instance. And now we can simply reference it here. That just makes things a tiny bit more performant. So if we now save this, go into Unity and hit play, we should see that after we spawn 150 cubes, it stops. But it hasn't actually stopped. It's still reusing cubes. But for some reason, they aren't really moving anywhere. They're just all stacked on top of each other. The reason for this is that our cube script is currently set up to only apply a force in the start method. And start is only called once when the object is actually instantiated. So what we need to do is create some kind of way in order to notify this object that it has just been reused. In other words, we need to create our own start method. And a fairly easy way to do this is using what we call an interface. Now, if we go into a project, we can go ahead and create a C -sharp script. Because this is going to be an interface, we'll start it with an I for interface. And we'll then call it pulled object. Let's open it up in Visual Studio. We don't want this to derive from mono behavior. We want to remove both of the functions. We can basically remove all of the namespaces and we don't want this to be a class, we want it to be an interface. Now basically what an interface does is allows you to specify some types and functions that all objects that derive from this interface have to implement. So in our case, we can just write void on object spawn and we'll just close it off like this. And that's pretty much all we need to write inside of our interface. If we now save this and go into our cube script, we want to make sure that our cube derives from mono behavior and, and this is where we put a comma, I pulled object. And you will see here that it now lights red. And the reason why is that, well, now this class derives from I pulled object, but it doesn't implement 
this on object spawn function. So we need to make sure to go in here and instead of using start, we want to use on object spawn. And we'll also want to mark it as public. And right away we can see that it no longer underlines with red because we're now implementing the function. What we can then do is save this and go into our object polar, go down to where we actually spawn an object from the pole. And in here, we can now get a component on the object that we're spawning. So object to spawn dot get component of type I pulled object. That's right, we can actually search for interfaces. We can store this in a variable. So I pulled object and we'll call it pulled object like this. Now it's not certain that we want all objects to have a script that derives from this interface. We want that to be optional. So we'll go in here and write if pulled object is not equal to null. Well, then we can actually call a function on this interface. And we of course want to go ahead and call on object spawn. So this should in fact search for the interface, check if it's not equal to null. And if it isn't, it will go in, access the interface, look for an implementation of this method. And then inside of the cube, actually call it and execute all of the code. So if we now save this, go into Unity and play, we can see that cubes are now being properly reused. Yay! Definitely play around with this and have fun with it. You can easily go in and add multiple pools. We could go ahead and try and increase the size here to 300 as well and check out the results. Of course, this object pool could be made more performant. One of the things that I would do is definitely try and get rid of the get component call. So definitely have fun with it yourself. Also, a cool guy from the community sent me over this script that he has made. You can check that out on GitHub. And also just quickly search the asset store and found this plugin that is currently free and looks like it has most of the functionality that you're going to need. I'll of course have link for both in the description. That's pretty much it for this video. Make sure to check out Skillshare. Simply click the link in the description for your chance to get a discount. Other than that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks to all of the awesome Patreon supporters who donated in January and a special thanks to Sean Carey, Diego Geik, Judeman, Diane Gein, Befio, Infinity PPR, Yorai Omer, Cyborg Mummy, Derek Heemskirk, Mur, Faisal Marify, Beard or Die, John Ramirez, DoubleTap45, James P, Superman the Great, John Burgard, Jason Latito, Alex Wakitsky, Bjorn Fuhrknapp, Suni Jakobsen, James Rogers, Robert Bund, Rob Farron, and Erasmus.